Okay. So hi, this is Claudia Phylos with the Center for Hellenic Studies, and we are here today kicking off our fall series of CHS Open House Discussions with Casey Due, uh, who's going to talk us to talk with us today about the Iliad and uh, the Bronze Age. Casey, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, thanks for having me. I think it's going to be fun to talk about some of these issues in an informal setting. Um, right. You know, before we, oh, sorry, go. Obviously, before we really kick it off, I just want to share some more information about you. Oh, okay. Um, with with our viewers, so I just want to let everyone know that you are currently the professor of classical studies at the University of Houston. You hold a BA in classics from Brown and an MA and PhD in classical philology from Harvard. Um, your teaching interests include ancient Greek old traditions, Homeric poetry, Greek tragedy, and textual textual criticism. Um, in addition, you are also one of the two main editors for the Homework Multitext Project, which is a very exciting project. Anyone, uh, you know, I hope we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit at the end. We're not really talking about that today. But I do want to point everyone towards your books that are currently available in their entirety for free on the CHS website. They're really, really beautiful and fascinating books. Um, one is called The Captive Woman's Lament in Greek Tragedy. Homeric Variation, another one, Homeric Variations on a Lament by Briseis. And then um, in connection with the Homer Multitext Project, you are the main editor for Recapturing a Homeric Legacy, Images and Insights from the Venetus A Manuscript of the Iliad. And finally, uh, you co-wrote a beautiful book on Iliad 10 and the Poetics of Ambush with Mary Abbott. Um, so that just gives people a background of the wide range of topics that you have been working on and researching over these uh, many years, Casey. So it's really a delight to have you come and talk to us about the Iliad and, and sort of taking us back in time, right? Because we're not just going to be talking about our text of the Iliad. We're going to be trying to understand um, sort of the historic, put it a little bit more in historical context, which is something that you get to work on on the Homer Multitext Project. Exactly, exactly. I mean, in the Homer Multitext, we're trying to understand where our Iliad comes from, what do our sources, the historical sources that do survive for the Iliad, what do they teach us about the long evolution of this poem? So this topic today is definitely um, in keeping with that. Um, now, I know a lot of people that are, the, the people who are here today, certainly, and a lot of the people that will be watching the video um, have uh, been part of uh, Heroes X, or they've yeah. certainly worked with uh, Greg Nosh, so they are familiar with the Iliad, and they're, um, it's not going to be new to them when I start talking about oral tradition and things like that. But um, And you have your own connection to the Heroes X project, right? You were once... Uh, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was, I was the head of TF of uh, yeah. Heroes when it was, you know, back when it was a, right, just a regular course at, at Harvard. Of course, hundreds of students took it back then. Right but they right, just right. took it in person. Right, over 10,000 students over the years had taken the course in, <laughs> on Harvard campus and uh, through extension, it's amazing. So, so you're, you know, we're, we're so connected, we're like family, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, intellectually, anyway, yes. Definitely. But even with all that background that everybody here has, probably at some point uh, you were told or you were taught that um, this monumental epic Greek poem, the Iliad, was composed by a man named Homer sometime around 700 BC. And that notion goes back to traditional tales that the ancient Greeks themselves told in classical times about a master poet named Homer who composed the poem that was the cornerstone of um, their culture. Um, but in fact, <laughs> we know that uh, the Iliad was composed within an oral epic tradition, an oral, an oral epic song tradition that goes back hundreds, maybe thousands of years or more before that date of 700 that is often thrown around for the date of Homer. Um, so uh, if you'd like, uh, Sarah, if you could show the, the slide number two, the one that says uh, that's labeled number two. We could just sort of put that up there right now. No, the next one. Yeah, that one. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a, a slide from, um, this is an image from Bronze Age uh, uh, Palace in the Peloponnese, um, so-called uh, Palace of Nestor and Pylos. Um, and it's a, it's a wall 
painting that, that shows um, a singer uh, with a lyre, and there's a large bird that seems to be the embodiment of um, his song. Um, and uh, I wanted to show you this image. We'll come back to it maybe in a moment, but I wanted to show you this image as I now talk a little bit about you know, the poems themselves, the, the Iliad and, and the Odyssey, the two epics that survived from, from antiquity that were attributed to Homer. They actually um, kind of reveal themselves in numerous ways to be the product of a long oral tradition. Um, they, uh, uh, for one thing, the composition and performance of epic poetry is depicted numerous times within the Iliad and Odyssey, um, and the process there is entirely oral, of course. Even one of the poets is even blind, you know, Demodocus and Book 8 of the Odyssey. Uh, so we have all these performances of epic poetry within the poems. We have Phemius in Book 1, who's entertaining the suitors, Book 1 of the Odyssey. We have Demodocus in Book 8, who is entertaining the Phaeacians, and always in the context of feasting. And then we, always have, we also have this very interesting performance um, uh, by Achilles. We don't get to hear his words, but we're told that, that when his comrades come to beg him to return to battle, uh, he is performing um, the Clea Androne, um, uh, the, the Glories of Heroes. That's in Book 9, right? Not Book 1. Book 9, right? Sorry, yes. So the place where he's singing the songs. Yes, it's Book yeah. 9. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. You're exactly okay. right. You're exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's right. Yeah, and so there's those depictions of performance, which are clearly oral in nature. Um, uh, but there's another clue in the poetry, of course, which I'm sure many of you already know about, which is the formulaic language that the poems are composed in. So the, it was the scholars Milman Perry and Albert Lord who showed that such a sophisticated storehouse of um, traditional language could only have been created over many generations and in the context of an um, oral tradition, where the poet needs to compose rapidly in performance. Um, they realized this by studying the South Slavic epic song tradition uh, that once flourished in the former Yugoslavia. Um, so watching the poets from, uh, from Yugoslavia, they were uh, able to, to witness how, how that they, how they um, uh, composed as they performed using traditional language and traditional tales. And when they observed this in the 1930s, and um, they were able to make a comparison to the Homeric poems and say, this is probably how a uh, Homeric epic was composed, or at least in much the same way. Um, so in this kind of system that they demonstrated, um, the song is constantly old and new at the same time, right? Every song is a new composition but it's composed using building blocks that have been handed down through time, even over hundreds of years. A particular formula that you might remember if you've read Homeric poetry is, you know, such and such a person spoke winged words. So that's another reason why I wanted to show you that, that image from Pylos, uh, from Bronze Age Pylos, let me stress. Um, because whenever I think of the, the formula winged words, I think of that fresco. Um, now, it's a famous formula. We're not entirely sure we know what it means. There's been a lot of debate about it. Um, but it seems to have something to do with capturing the fleeting nature of speech, and, and hence, you know, of, of oral poetry. Um, and, uh, and so this fresco could, could possibly be a visualization of, of of winged words, in a way, of poetry as winged words. But I have to, to tell you, though, um, oral poetry in a traditional song culture is not actually fleeting. Um, it endures and evolves over time within this um, traditional meeting, uh, medium. And in fact, um, and I think you probably, a lot of you know this theme well, but I think it's worth saying again, you know, whereas mortal heroes like, like Achilles necessarily die, um, epic poetry is said to be, in Iliad 9, unwilting. 
it doesn't die. It doesn't perish. So, um, Sarah, if you could show the the next um, slide that was number three. You see this famous passage, right? My mother, the goddess Thetis of the shining feet, tells me that there are two ways in which I may meet my end. If I stay here and fight around the city of Troy, my homecoming is lost, but my glory and song will be unwilting. And this word, aphiton, which means unperishable, not wilting. Whereas I, I reach home, my glory and song, my chaos is lost, but my life will be long, and the outcome of death will not soon take me. So poetry endures, right? Poetry lives on, even though the hero has to die. And um, the way this works is that we have countless singers composing and performance, not just one, not just one fixed text, but a process, a system that's going on and on and on from generation to generation. Um, and, and what has been shown, um, as Perry and Lord initiated, but is become clear in scholarship over, over the decades is that, that this is a system that evolved over a really long period of time. And so as a result, Homeric Greek is a complex amalgamation of some extremely ancient formulas that are mixed in with some newer ones of various eras. And it's almost like an archaeological dig, like you have these earlier and later strata, but they can't be separated out unlike an archaeological dig, they can't be separated out from one another. You can't be like, here's the, you know, Bronze Age layer, and here's the Iron Age layer, and here's the this layer. You can't do that. They're all seamlessly intertwined, as we're going to see in just a minute. So my main purpose today is to just very briefly talk about what the evidence we have that something like our Iliad was already being performed in the Greek Bronze Age, so a really long time ago, long before that date of 700 that people often throw around. Now, of course, we know there was writing in the Bronze Age, the so-called script known as Linear B, but the Mycenaean Greeks did not seem to use it for writing literature at all. Um, instead, uh, they seem to have had an oral epic song tradition, as suggested by the fresco from Pylos that I've already shown you. Now, as a scholar, I personally very much admire uh, somebody named E.S. Sherratt, uh, who has analyzed these different passages in the Iliad as examples of um, some of the difficulties of relating material culture to the Iliad. So if we could just look at the slide that I think is slide number five. So we'll, we'll skip over linear B and just go straight to slide number five, if that's okay, Sarah. Let's look at this passage and then consider its implications, okay? So now the son of Peleus set, up, set in place a lump of pig iron, which had once been the throwing weight of Aetian in his great strength. But now swift-footed brilliant Achilles had slain him and taken the weight away in the, his ships along with the other possessions. He stood upright and spoke his word out among the Argives. Rise up, you who would endeavor to win this prize also. For although the rich domain of him who wins it lies far off indeed, yet for the succession of five years he'll have it to use. For his shepherd, for want of iron, will not have to go into the city for it, nor his plowman either. This will supply them. Now, Sherat, I'm just going to quote Sherat here because she says it very well. She writes, We have here what seems to be a rather odd situation. A lump of unworked iron has been regarded as a prized possession for a long time, first as a favorite throwing weight of a king and hero, and then as something worth taking as a spoil of war, and then as worth having as a prestigious prize. Yet it is suddenly, almost as an afterthought, recognized as having its prime desirability and a potential for utilitarian use as a source of agricultural and pastoral tools. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the implications of that just yet, but I hope I've planted a seed. Let's talk about shields now before we before we discuss these this passage. So, um, uh, so I don't think I have a slide for this one, but let me just read one more quote from Sharat. She says, um, and this is a by the way, I should say this is from an article called Archaeology and the it's called Reading the Text: Archaeology and the Homeric Question. And it's one of my favorite articles about Homer of all time. So I'm just going to quote her one more time. Well, 
the second of third of the last. <laughs> anyway, let me just quote her. She says, uh, Ajax's shield is an extraordinary affair, which, as Ajax enters the battle in Iliad 7, is described as tower-like. It is made of seven layers of oxide, to which an eighth layer of bronze has been added, apparently as an afterthought. As if this were not enough, this shield, a few lines further on in the thick of the fight, suddenly acquires a boss, which has no part in the original description. Hector, too, has a very odd shield. At one point, it's described as extending from his neck to his ankles, and at another, as completely circular. That is a shield worth trying to imagine. So if we could go to the, the next slide, um, Sarah, the one that's called number six. Um, believe it is. So she says, while these oddities have been dismissed as examples of the inconsistencies and discrepancies one might expect in poetry simultaneously composed and recited orally, the archaeological record suggests that what we have in each case is the juxtaposition or superimposition of more than one chronological reflection. So in the Bronze Age, iron was an exotic luxury would have been minimally worked, valuable simply for being a precious metal. After the Bronze Age, blades appear, then daggers and swords. So what she's basically saying is that in the first part of the, of the passage we looked at um, about the lump of iron, uh, we're seeing kind of a Bronze Age idea of what iron is, sort of valued for its own intrinsic value as a, as a rare metal. Um, but then by the end of the passage, um, we're seeing, and, and she says that, that that idea of iron as a, a rare metal would have been pre prevalent between the 16th and 12th centuries BCE. But then in the second part of the passage, the understanding of iron belongs to a time from about 1000 CE when iron tools were regularly being produced. Um, same thing with the shields path, the shield stuff, um, you know, tower-like, rectangular or figure of eight shields um, are what you find in the Mycenaean period, uh, but these became redundant once body armor was introduced in the 14th century. Um, and then at the end of the 13th century, you get these smaller handheld shields. Um, if we could go to the next slide, uh, there's a wonderful illustration of this. So um, can everybody see it? The next slide. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so we see that the first two uh, warriors uh, are come from the pre-palatial and early palatial period of the Mycenaean civilization, so 16th to early 14th century, whereas um, warrior C is from the post-palatial period, 12th to early 8th century, and D is uh, um, from the late 8th century. And we see all, all of that kind of weaponry uh, used in the Iliad, all kind of mixed together, often in the same passage, right? So Achilles is famous for his Pelion ash spear, which is a thrusting spear, but then in other passages he throws it like a javelin. So we see um, how different understanding of, of weaponry, thrusting spears versus throwing spears, and all of which you would carry two of, but there are passages where it's kind of confusing because the hero throws a spear, and then what is he going to do? He doesn't have a spear, and then a god has to get it back for him. Um, you know, so uh, we see how this sort of amalgamation of um, uh, physical objects from different eras um, has has come together uh, in our poem. Um, and uh, if we could just look, uh, so if you see on um, the warrior that's warrior A on the slide, um, you, uh, sorry, let me get my, so yeah, if you, if you look at Warrior A on the slide, um, he has a little Boar's Tusk helmet, and I just can't resist uh, showing you a passage from Iliad 10 about this, so if we could go to the next slide, which is number eight. Um, so this is when the Odysseus is about to go out on a night raid with Diomedes um, in book 10, and they don't have any armor, so everybody has to give them stuff to wear and armor to take. And Marinace gave to Odysseus a bow and a quiver and a sword, and he placed on his head a leather cap made of hide. On the inside, many leather straps were stretched tight. On the outside, white tusks from a white tusk boar were arranged one after the other, well and skillfully. 
and in the middle there was a layer of felt fastened to it. This helmet from Amator of Eleon, the descendant of Ormanos, Altolicus took, breaking into his closely fitted house. And, and he, that is Altolicus, gave it to Amphidamas of Kithera to take to Scandea, and Amphidamas gave it to Molos as a guest gift, and he gave it to his son Marinace to carry, and then it covered, it surrounded and closely covered the head of Odysseus. Now one of the things I love about uh, this passage is that it shows the Borstest helmet as having a nice long history. And in fact, Borstest helmets were not used after the Bronze Age. So this would have been a very ancient uh, object <laughs> by, by um, later stages of the Iliadic tradition. Um, we find them in Bronze, uh, Bronze Age tombs. Um, we find them depicted in Mycenaean frescoes, uh, but they were not used after uh, the Bronze Age. Now, one other, I'm going to move on from Sherat to talk about uh, one other really fascinating article, one of, another one of my favorite articles of all time, uh, that addresses the idea of how old is the story of the Iliad. Um, so we're, we're wrestling with the question is, you know, was something like our Iliad being performed in the Bronze Age? And then we have to wonder, well, how old is the story? How far could it possibly um, go back? So there's an article by uh, Sarah Morris um, called A Tale of Two Cities. Um, and uh, if we could, um, oh, if we could actually, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Could we show the next slide with the Borscht Test helmet just so people can see what it looks like? This is nine, yeah, so there we go. Um, there it is, beautiful. Um, now, <laughs> now let's go to the next slide after that, number 10. Um, so the title of, of Sarah Morris's article is taken um, from uh, the Shield of Achilles passage in Iliad 18. Um, so just to refresh your memory about it, uh, on, on, on Achilles' new shield that, he, that Hephaestus makes for him in this book, uh, it says, Hephaestus wrought also on it two, fair, two cities, fair to see and busy with the hum of men. In the one were weddings and wedding feasts, and they were going about the city with brides whom they were escorting by torchlight from their chambers. About the other city, there lay encamped two hosts in gleaming armor. So we see this contrast between the city at war and the city at peace um, made on the shield. Well, um, there, if we could go to the next slide, um, we'll see that on the Bronze Age uh, island of Thera, um, the one that uh, you know had the volcano erupt and then it sunk into the sea and then uh, uh, formed a caldera uh, around, the, the, a caldera was formed, so now you can go visit the rim of the island, but most of the island has been sunk into the sea. This volcanic eruption that destroyed the island of Thera, we now know um, uh, to have occurred, well, science has, de has determined that it occurred in 1628 BC. I think it has to do with um, a tree, a tree uh, organic matter that they found from a tree in the, in the lava that they were able to somehow date. I'm sorry, I'm not very good with the science of archaeology. I apologize. But um, I, I read this article in a very impressive journal that I've trusted that uh, suggested that, that we now have a date for the volcanic eruption of 1628 BC. So um, that means that the frescoes that we found, that archaeologists found on the walls of the remaining uh, uh, houses that are on the rim of the caldera, um, these frescoes have to be that old, right? They have to be from the 1600s BCE. And these frescoes show um, what seems to be, so it goes around the four walls of a room, and two of the walls are, are long, and they have like nilotic scenes. Um, but on the north and south wall, you have uh, what seems to be basically a city, a city at war, city at peace type of scene where on one, you can see this one um, on the slide that I have now, uh, it's ships going back and forth between cities. Um, and it certainly seems peaceful. Uh, it seems to be fe uh, festival-like. Uh, the ships are decorated. Everybody, you know, basically seems happy. Um, and it, it seems festive or religious or certainly not warlike in nature. 
Um, and let's go uh, to sorry. let's go scroll through. Um, if we could see the next slide really quick, uh, number twelve. This is just a modern drawing to give you a little bit of a better idea of what the frescoes look like. They're small. They're not very big. Uh, they go around like almost like a what do you call like a decorative border around the top of the room. Um, but one thing I love about this. Um, reconstruction is uh, you can see a little Borscht Tusk helmet that's uh, uh, on the, it's like, like the captain has put up his helmet, you know, he's not wearing it right now on one of the ships. Do you see that? <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, in any case, this is a peaceful scene, right? Now let's go to the next, the next uh, slide, number 14. So you see, this is from the north wall, and on this wall, it certainly does not look peaceful anymore. Um, actually, if we could go to uh, already go ahead and go to the next slide where it's zoomed up a little bit more, it'll be easier to see. So on this wall, you have what certainly seems to be Mycenaean warriors attacking. They have long, you know, tower-like shields, um, oxide-covered shields like we have described in the Iliad. They're wearing Borstas helmets, and you can see there's some sort of naval battle happening um, where people seem to be dying in the bottom part of the scene. Um, there are people on, on the walls looking out. Um, there's another part of the fresco where they may be having some sort of council of war. There's also shepherds in the scene, um, you know, so we don't know, is this some sort of cattle raid happening? Um, uh, or, or is it more, again, the juxtaposition of peace and war, like we see in some of the similes of the Iliad? Um, but what, let me just cut to the chase and say that Sarah Morris has argued that these frescoes are telling a story, and they're telling a story, if so, and if she's correct, that some of the oldest narrative art in existence, by the way, but um, they're telling a story, and they're telling a story that has remarkable affinities with the Iliad. Amazing ones. I mean, you have to read the article and, 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 t and take my word on it for now. But she has, and she, what she's not saying, she's not trying to say that these frescoes are illustrating our Iliad. That's not what she's saying. But just that these frescoes are telling a story, and they're telling the same sort of story like our Iliad tells. That's her, that's her main thesis. But I have to say, she comes up with a lot of very surprising and amazing affinities between these paintings and the Iliad. It, it's not just general, there's even specifics there that are really kind of fascinating to think about. And again though, I don't think these paintings are illustrating our Iliad as we have it now, but are illustrating something like our Iliad with Mycenaean warriors coming and attacking. Um, you know, Thera is near, closer to, to Asia Minor, closer to where Troy is than it is to where Greece is. Um, it 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 uh, it certainly shows something like Mycenaeans attacking and and um, a, a city and coming with their ships and and all of that stuff. Um, so Casey, can I just ask a follow up? So I mean, as we're thinking about the kind of um, the kind of way to think about that, it sounds like we're talking about they have similar themes, right? The yes, meta context. exactly. Know, similar themes, right? And, and we know from the work of Power and Lord that you know, works like the Iliad and the Odyssey are really composed by theme. So it seems like maybe what we're That's what right. you're talking about is sort of similar thematic content, maybe driving the narration within this image and exactly like the Iliad and the Odyssey, what how our it might have existed during that period. That's right. And that so and I have two more points I want to make and then I know I want to have time for questions. But the yes, what I want to say really quickly is that this is of course 400 years older than the end of the Bronze Age. So it's much, these paintings are much earlier than even the Trojan War is typically dated, if you want to believe in a real Trojan War. Same thing with some of those weapons and artifacts that we talked about. Those go back to the 1600s, 1500s, 1400s BCE, long before the time when even the Trojan War is usually dated, much less the Iliad, right? Um, uh, the last, uh, oh no, the Second to last, you know, 
point I want to make for suggesting that the Iliad is indeed very old is to look at um, a, a particular verse. Uh, let's not put the slide up yet. Let me just say that um, you know the plot of the Iliad whereby uh, Patroclus goes into battle taking Achilles' place, wearing his armor. Then he is killed by Hector, who then takes Patroclus' armor, and then Achilles returns to battle uh, with new armor, combats Hector, and kills Hector. There's all these fascinating uh, uh, substitutions going on between, like, you know, Patroclus impersonating Achilles, um, and then Hector uh, being Patroclus, being Achilles, you know, and, and all of these kinds of things. It's very, very fascinating. Now, many people have seen this as the sophistication that has resulted from a master poet uh, putting the final touches at the end of the tradition um, on on a great poem. So these are the this is the work of the genius Homer. He's the one that has seen these possibilities, and some people even ascribe to this genius the invention of Patroclus as a character. And it's you know because of this this uh, genius uh, that um, uh, that the Iliad acquired the structure and shape that it has, the beautiful uh, thing that we admire. However, uh, I'm going to suggest to you that this plot and this deep structure of the Iliad is incredibly ancient. And this isn't my idea. Other people have had this idea. I'm taking it from other people. But let's go to the next slide now and look at it. So if you know a little bit of Greek, this will help. But you don't have to because I'll talk you through it. So the same verse exactly describes the death of Patroclus and the death of Hector, which you, know, you just might want to stop and think about for a second. The exact same verse is used to describe the death of Patroclus and Hector. So all those interconnections that we were talking about play out in verse form. And this is the verse. Um, oh, it's several verses, you know. But uh, so uh, when he had thus spoken, his eyes were closed in the finality of death. His life breath left his body and flitted down to the house of Hades, mourning its sad fate and bidding farewell to the youth and the vigor of its manhood. Now, this is the Greek I've given you on the slide. Um, but what I want to call your attention to, of course, you know that the Iliad is composed in the dactylic hexameter, that all the formulaic language can, um, uh, fits with this dactylic hexameter. Um, it'd be too long a discussion to go into how formula and meter um, go together, but they, they do go very closely together. And you shouldn't see uh, the, the formulaic language or the meter as constricting the poet, but in fact allowing him to express himself um, within this tradition. Um, and if you look at that last verse of the, of the Greek, um, the dactylic hexameter there uh, is a little bit messed up because the dactylic hexameter should be uh, long, short, short. You can, you can have two longs in place of long, short, short, but you have six feet of basically long, short, short, 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 and then usually long, long at the end. So you have six feet of this, these dactyls. But look at the fourth foot of this verse that describes both Achilles, I mean Hector's and Patroclus' death. We have long, long, short. That does not work at all. <laughs> um, it, it, uh, it is, um, uh, and, and, and Okay, now you're just going to have to trust me on this, but historical linguists um, have shown that uh, in an earlier form of Greek, prior to the end of the Bronze Age, that verse would have scanned. So um, the form androtita is, a, is a, later, a later form of an earlier word where it would have worked. Um, I don't want to get too much into the technicalities and not being a linguist myself, really, I, I don't even feel confident doing that, but um, I can point you to the bibliography. Um, in fact, I already have uh, on, the, on the page for this Hangout, uh, Claudia had posted uh, the, the article by Calvert Watkins. He actually wasn't the first person either to observe this. Um, he's building on the work of earlier scholars, uh, but his article is very accessible in the form of um, his book. Uh, how to kill a dragon in Indo-European. Um, so, uh, so what he is saying and what earlier scholars have said is that 
this verse would have been able to have been composed in the Bronze Age. After the Bronze Age, it's not metrically sound anymore. But the tradition is so conservative that it kept it, it kept it because it's conservative. It kept that verse and made it work just the way like you can make um, a rhyme work if you really have to. You kind of squish some syllables together or whatever. The singers made it work because it was so important and so structurally important to the whole poem to keep that verse. And, um, and so they kept that verse even though it didn't scan properly anymore. So it shows you... Um, like I said, the conservativeness of this tradition, but it also shows you sort of like that this is part of the deep structure of the Iliad. And the deep structure of the Iliad goes back to the Bronze Age, if you if you trust me on, on this evidence, if you trust Calvert Watkins, if you trust Backer Nagel and other scholars. Okay, last point I'm going to make is, um, and we can look at the next slide if you have a chance, 16, um, Sarah. Uh, it's just to say that Greek is an Indo-European language, um, and that uh, this song tradition very likely goes back to an Indo-European epic tradition, which is why there are similarities between Irish uh, saga, well, Irish myth and legends, and Greek uh, myth and epic poetry, and also um, uh, on the Indo part of Indo-European Sanskrit epic. So uh, we have a phrase in Sanskrit that matches metrically, um, and, and uh, well, this is what Greg Nash has argued, that there's an equivalent phrase in Sanskrit epic for the kleos aftiton that we looked at earlier from Iliad 9, the imperishable glory, the unwilting fame um, that I said was sort of like the core theme of the Iliad of the contrasting the mortal hero with the immortality of song. Greg Nagy has argued that the equivalent of that phrase in Greek exists in Sanskrit epic. hope I'm saying it right, Shravas um, Ashkitam. And, uh, and so what we see, what this suggests, um, is that maybe something like our epic existed, something like our Iliad existed in the Bronze Age, but if it did, it itself is the evolution out of an Indo-European um, epic tradition that goes even further back, very, very, very far back, to when we had the Proto-Indo-European um, speakers. So, um, can I just say a couple of implications of, of this, of what I have suggested? So, one is that you know an oral tradition implies a long, a long evolution over time, um, and uh, so that means that, you know, if we have something like our Iliad in the Bronze Age, then that's as much as a thousand years before people usually date a Homer, if they believe in a Homer, uh, that was the author of the Iliad. And uh, this also has implications for how we date the Trojan War, because if we can prove through language that the Iliad is older than the traditional date of the Trojan War, well, how could there be a poem about the Trojan War that predates the Trojan War? Right? That doesn't really make sense. Um, if there really was a Trojan War, then I think we have to assume it got mapped onto a pre-existing oral epic tradition about heroes and, war and Greeks you know, attacking a foreign city. Um, and Another implication of all this is that such a sophisticated um, system of oral composition over hundreds of years, I mean, obviously, uh, cannot be um, the work of one man, <laughs> right? So we, we need to stop thinking in terms of, of Homer and start trying to reconstruct the system and appreciate the system for all its beauty and, and everything it has to offer, rather than obsessing over what were the contributions of one of the last singers in the tradition. Um, and I think that's what I think I'll better stop there and, and just sit back and see your reactions and see if there are any questions okay Casey that was just so beautiful and dazzling you've put so much on the table for us to discuss um, you know from the boar socks helmets to the beautiful symmetry in the passages describing the death of Hector and Patroclus um, to the beautiful Theron frescoes 
So, you know, there's a lot that people might want to respond to. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to open the floor. Um, does I see one hand. Um, Maria? Uh, and, and can you introduce yourself just very briefly, just saying your name and where you're from uh, before you talk? Thanks, Maria. Oh, Maria, you're muted. Can, can you hear me? Yes. No, we can. Yes. Uh, I would like to thank Casey for her uh, beautiful, uh, con beautifully constructed argument. Uh, what I would like to know, um, and uh, if uh, uh, Casey can provide us with some more feedback, I found very fascinating this idea that she, uh, she put forward, uh, the, like a Trojan War, like there is a narrative a pre-existing narrative, then the Trojan War, this is how I understood it, and then, of course, we have a long line of rhapsodes or professional uh, uh, poets, and uh, then um, we have both the historical event and the narrative coincide. Is it possible, to, I mean, to uh, elaborate on, on this? Sure. Yes, I mean, anything I say is necessarily incredibly speculative, right? Yes, yes. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of information now from the archaeological site of Troy that, you know, we, we believe is the same Troy as in the Iliad. There's nothing there saying, I'm Troy. There's no inscription proving that it's Troy. But for a lot of reasons, we believe the site of Hisarlik that has been excavated for so many years now since Heinrich Schliemann excavated um, in the 1880s and 70s, um, we feel that that's a city of Troy. And there's a lot uh, of, of evidence even in the Hittite, surviving Hittite documents uh, to suggest that um, certainly Mycenaeans were involving themselves in the Anatolian Peninsula during the Bronze Age in the region of Troy mm -hmm. um, and other places too. So there are tantalizing historical glimpses of, uh, of like real history that we could make match up with our Iliad in some ways, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I think we have to be really aware that the poetic tradition is independent of the history, mm -hmm. even if historical events influence the direction of the of the of the poetic tradition probably very quickly the tradition became independent of any uh, uh, actual historical event so what I mean by that is um, there for example are real places in the catalog of ships mm -hmm. right um, and they have descriptions and one of the things I've wrestled with in my work is are the descriptions that are given of various places in the catalog of ships, like one is called uh, as having uh, beautiful dancing places. Did it really have beautiful dancing places? Or was a good city in the Bronze Age, is the tradition that remembers that cities of the Bronze Age have good wide dancing places. So if you, if you want to uh, describe a city as being like, you know, a, an important city in the Bronze, uh, uh, in this tradition, you say it had beautiful dancing places. Um, so we're, we always have to be careful to think about, you know, is there a reality that's being transmitted in the poem? Or um, has the tradition kind of um, set up its own sort of principles that it's working with that, that operate, like its own poetics that operate independently of reality. So mm -hmm. I'm willing to entertain the idea that real events um, influence the shape of this poetic tradition, but I'm personally much more interested in the poetics aside from the history. Do you know what I'm saying? And, yes, uh, yes, I, yes I teach, absolutely. I teach a class that um, I have taught it for a couple of years now um, that looks at all these questions and that looks like, was there really a Trojan War? Was there really a Homer? Was there, um, you know, all that stuff? And, and what's the, the reality? What is the archaeological evidence? Um, and that stuff is fascinating too. But as a scholar, I'm more interested in just trying to understand the poetics of the system, which I don't think are... Um, bound in any way by a historical reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I fully 
I, I fully understand what you mean. Thank you very much. Uh, what I wanted to stress is this uh, very useful um, um, a new thing that you brought into our discussion that we have to distance ourselves uh, from considering the narrative and the historical events as one and the same. It's another thing the historicity of the event and another thing the narrative that was contrived probably many even there is this possibility as, as you said uh, many years or hundreds of years b before the, the, the event took place and I find this very fascinating because I'm currently reading you know Anthony Snodgrass is the dark age of Greece but in, in a way he also points out that we have to distance ourselves or what for example Homer says or Hesiod says on the, or then Herodotus says about um, Homeric po uh, uh, poems so thank you very much for pointing this. <laughs> thank you, Maria. That was a beautiful question um, and, and a beautiful response, Casey. So uh, I, I, you know, at the end of this talk, I'd like to share some more links to some of the things that you mentioned that people might want to um, might want to learn more about. But I want to take more questions now. Anyone else have another question? Everyone's being a little shy. <laughs> It's a lot of okay, stuff. Let's see let me to, no, 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 it's okay. I think um, Sarah, sorry. do you have a question? Okay. Oh, oh, I think Helen has actually. Go, go ahead, Helen. No, no, sorry, you're you're unmuted. Can you go, and then we'll take Helen's question at, right after. Well, yeah, I, I'm. It's not really so much a question as as being just completely um, fascinated by what you what you had to say, and I'm very very interested in uh, the evidence that has come from. Um, from other Indo-European traditions where there are simi similar formulas or similar themes uh, and again the, the, the same might apply to those um, by, by definition I would have thought that um, none of them are referring specifically they're using similar themes maybe uh, uh, similar formulas I'm particularly I'm interested in the in the formulas and the epithets it's a, from what you were saying it sounds as if there may be part of the evidence that, that does pin it back to the, the earliest times. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, in terms of co uh, other Indo-European traditions, I just want to say, although I don't have any professional expertise in this area, I've always been interested in Irish uh, myths and legends, and uh, those are usually, you know, our textual sources for those are, are, are much later than the Iliad, and people typically date them much later than our Iliad, but I would be somebody that would entertain that they go back very, very far, as far as, again, very speculative stuff, but I, I would think they go back as far as the Bronze Age too. They're part of this uh, shared uh, Indo-European heritage. Um, and so, you know, there's a book I, I found one time, it's very old, it's like 100 years old, but it's called Cuculin, the Irish Achilles. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I treasure that book. Um, but uh, in terms of, of formulas and epithets, this is one of my my top my favorite topics too. I love the epithets. I feel that um, again, I, I've been very influenced by Greg Nash on this. That uh, the epithets are the kind of most compressed way of selling telling a hero's story. So calling someone Achilles swift-footed Achilles is the the most compressed way you can kind of fit his story into like one phrase, right? And I think the swift-footed is calling attention to not only necessarily like his chase of Hector around the walls of Troy, but also his, um, if you look in the tradition, and I'll just have to plug myself here, uh, there's constant references to Achilles as an ambusher. We think of him as a, you know, face-to-face -face in the front lines of battle fighter, and certainly he excels at that. He's a promocos on air, but he also ambushes all the time, and ambush involves running you have to run very quickly because you hide and then the person comes by and then you chase them. Um, so uh, I think Swiftwood encapsulates all that. Same with actually um, Polutlas Odysseus. You're going to think, um, you know, much enduring Odysseus. Uh, it's typical to interpret that as uh, encapsulating the fact that he has to endure so many things on his travels home. But um, one thing that Mary Abbott and I found in our work on Ambush again is that endurance is one of the key uh, qualities associated with an ambusher, that you have to be able to hide and endure a cramped 
painful sometimes space for long periods of time. And so the classic example is um, Odysseus uh, having to hold on to the sheep all night long while he waits for the uh, uh, Cyclops to open up the cave. And uh, there's all this reference to, you know, Polutlos Odysseus, Odysseus there. Uh, but another example would be Polutropos Odysseus, right? So he can, um, so that's Odysseus who can turn into many things of many, it's got like, you know, the man of many turns or the man who many disguises or whatever. Polutropos, you can sort of turn into anything. Um, and of course, that sort of is a wonderful compressed way of summing up Odysseus as a character, right? He's a chameleon. Uh, type hero. Um, so uh, I think these epithets probably have super, super long history, a lot of them, and are like some of the most fundamental aspects of the system. And that's how um, Milman Perry actually got his start uh, studying the epithets. His first major work was called The Traditional Epithet in Homer. Well, that's the English translation. Um, but uh, it was one of his Paris uh, dissertations and, or theses. Um, and uh, at the Sorbonne, and uh, in, in that work, one of the things I love about this work, it's a very long work, but it's so worth reading. In that one very, very long sort of article slash dissertation or whatever, he shows, he demonstrates with evidence the, um, uh, what, the, what he called the economy of the system of Homeric diction, such that there were not many ways to say the same thing in the same metrical space, often just one or two ways to say it. Um, and, uh, and, and I don't want to, I mean, we could go into a, a long thing about formulaic language, but one of the things I, I, I love about it is that he wasn't thinking in oral terms then. He was just working what he had, with what he had, and he was like, this is a traditional system that evolved over a long period of time and was definitely not the work of one person. It couldn't be because there's like, you know, um, 13 different ways of saying Achilles in the vocative, and they all have a different metrical configuration. That's just like one example. That could not be the work of one man. So he was seeing it as a system already then, but he was not thinking in terms of orality or oral tradition because he hadn't gone to Yugoslavia yet. He hadn't observed that yet. It was actually his professor, Maye, who suggested that you know, he start thinking in terms of oral tradition. But before that, he was just working with the evidence and saw, hey, there's a system here. It's an incredibly economic system. And he started with epithets. That's what he started with, you know, swift-footed Achilles, stuff like that. Fabulous. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Helen had a question. Yes. Thank you very Montreal, much. Montreal, right? Yes, Helen from Montreal. Thank you very much for your expose. It's so interesting. It's really, really great to hear you. Um, I just had a question. Could you tell, tell us a little bit more about wing words? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, what can I say about wing words? OK, so it's one of those phrases that uh, people aren't sure what it means. Like they have looked at all the contexts in which things are called winged words, and people have come up with different theories as to uh, what it means. So um, if I'm remembering right, and I could be remembering it wrong, um, uh, Richard Martin has something about winged words um, connected with speech acts, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, if you look at Deborah Beck has written a book about speech introductions in the Iliad, and she talks about like heightened emotion um, associated with winged words. Um, some people talk about winged words as a kind of like um, uh, it's a little bit differently. They think about it, you know, in terms of like metaphors and being a dead metaphor, so that it doesn't really have any meaning anymore. So that like maybe it's just like something you say. It's just kind of like a filler. I wouldn't go that far. Um, I think it still has, has meaning. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and I think what I would, I haven't written this up in any kind of scholarly way, so this is me just putting myself out there, but I'll just say that, I mean, I do think it has to do with this image of poetry as a bird in flight. Um, uh, and the idea of um, and I'm not the first person to say this, that, you know, once it's taken flight, 
you can't take it back, right? It, you say you say the winged words, and they they have gone off and they've flown away like like a bird. But I, I think it's interesting because, like I say, to 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 ascribe um, to describe the poetry as sort of flying away or fleeting in this way is a direct contradiction to the way elsewhere uh, poetry is imagined as enduring and living on and um, being this unwilting thing um, that, that, uh, that, that stays forever. So um, I haven't got it all figured out by any means, but I just love to think about it. I love to think about that fresco. I love to think about the formula winged words possibly going back to the Bronze Age. Um, and into a Bronze Age notion of poetry as a bird. Oh, and uh, I should say too, while I'm while I'm crediting scholars, that um, someone who you probably guys all know, uh, Olga Lavaniuk, has written some beautiful things about birds and Homeric poetry. And of course, there's Greg Nagy's um, poetry as performance, which yes. has a long discussion of um, the multiformity of epic poetry as um, being connected to um, the variation in the nightingale song. So there's just so much to think about with birds and winged words and poetry, and I just I won't pretend to you guys that I have it all figured out, but it's something that I love to think about. Well, thank you very much. For your <laughs> okay, Casey, you know, it's 3 o'clock, so I just want to check with you. Um, do, do we need to sign off promptly? Or can Take one more question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We can do another question. Okay, let, let's take one more question. Anyone else? How about you, Jack? I thought yeah. you might. Yes. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, well, what a what a great uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, I, uh, I was um, encouraged by Sarah actually to um, to read Watkins' book, and I, I think it's great. And I and I found. Uh, Rereading, uh, uh, reading the whole of Beowulf in Old English, and and, uh, and now getting into some Old Norse, and uh, reading Ku uh, Cullen Tame Bo Kualinga. I'm not pronouncing it very well. I'm sure. I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, puppy dog. Uh, um, anyway, uh, I, I, I see. Uh, that you know, he is he has basically just taken one little instance, you know, uh, it, you know, the idea of of um, killing a dragon or killing a snake or a demon or something, uh, and uh, and uh, followed it through in in uh, a number of literatures. But uh, you know, this is just one instance. Uh, you, you know, he, he he's written this I don't know five or six hundred page book. Uh, on on one of the phrases that fit into what you call the system uh, mm -hmm. that you know it predates uh, all writing and uh, you know we have you know in so many different uh, I want to call them extensions or or variations in the different literatures especially the the early literatures where they're more drawing on on the oral tradition, and uh, it's not like uh, Virgil or Apollonius of Rhodes uh, copying uh, a set uh, uh, literary, you know, intertextuality uh, uh, sort of uh, development. So I'm, my question is, uh, couldn't we in this age of big data have something to, to reconstruct the Proto-Indo-European myth? Hmm. Oh, well, I think we totally should, and I think we're, we're getting there. Uh, I mean, not yet. I mean, I think we're taking baby steps towards that direction. But um, I think, uh, first I'll just say, though, um, Calvert Watkins is an amazing intellect uh, that he could do what he did with that one formula. But I think what he was picking, what he thought he was doing was picking out the most essential formula, like sort of for him, the sort of basis of an Indo-European poetic tradition uh, would have been basically the formula is you know hero slays dragon you know and then and then that's at the core of this Indo-European poetic tradition that evolved and evolved into you know the Irish myth and the Celt I mean, the Celtic you know the Celtic myths and the Greek and the Sanskrit and every and all the other traditions that we know the Norse and the Germanic all that stuff um, 
And so he took the one that he thought was at the, the core. But since you bring up Watkins, I just have to say, uh, and then I'll come back to your point, but I remembered when you were bringing him up that, because uh, you talked about Beowulf, which is another one of those late texts that to me has a really, 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 really long history that we can't necessarily reconstruct now with our available evidence, but is very likely goes back very, very far, right? Um, and uh, so Watkins um, quotes uh, a line from Beowulf in conjunction with the verse that I showed you about the death of Hector and Patroclus and the soul flitting away to Hades, lamenting its youth and manhood. Um, and so the quote from Beowulf was, uh, uh, from his bosom went his soul to seek the glory of the true. And uh, so he's just, anyway, it, it's not an exact parallel, but it's a, it's a beautiful uh, um, parallel with, with, the, with the Iliad. Um, yeah. So uh, on the term, on the idea of reconstructing Indo-European um, poetics, Indo-European formulas, well, I have to say there's not a ton of scholars working in this area. I think it's an amazing subject. Uh, the problem is, is that there's not that many people trained in the Indo-European, uh, in the linguistics needed to do this kind of work. Uh, and I know this is something that Greg Nagy and um, Douglas Frame and Leonard Mulner, all associated with Center for Linux Studies, are promoting every way they know how. But in some ways, they're of a generation where people were studying this stuff. And, and Watkins was even older than them. Um, and then, uh, not to say they're old. I'm not saying this right. But he's, he, he was Greg Nagy's teacher is what I mean, right? Exactly. Right, exactly. So, and they, they came from a tradition of studying linguistics. And, right. And then maybe That's, every class this really would have been you started out with Latin and Greek in, you know, in grade school. Right, right. And so then when you got to graduate school, you were doing advanced linguistics. So like when I got to graduate school at Harvard, um, I was right away taking a historical linguistics class, but I was completely out of my depth. I've never taken anything like it. You know, I was sort of, it was sort of assumed that I had done all this prior work that I had not done. And I don't think anybody in my generation of students was doing. So it's, I don't think that I was particularly untrained. I think it was just that people weren't doing that. Right? I mean, I came from a fairly traditional program. We did Greek prose composition, Latin prose composition, that kinds of stuff. But we, we didn't have the linguistics background that people like Greg Nagy and Leonard Milner and Douglas Frame have. And they can do this kind of reconstruction of Indo-European poetics. Um, and some people are doing it. I don't want to say no one's doing it. I'm just saying that there are not a ton of people who, are, who have the training and philological expertise to be able to do it. But I totally support it. What I think is going to help is the... Um, the, the emergence of digital humanities and um, the way of you know, making these sort of big projects that, uh, with lots of data uh, that can be coded in interesting ways. Um, and I think the Homer Multitext you know, could, could contribute to this um, in some ways. Um, basically just making it possible to search by uh, metrical configuration, to search uh, by formulaic language, by formulas, half lines, lines, um, things like that, finding um, not only the, like, the exact formulas themselves, but analogous formulas, formulas with the same metrical configuration, things like that. Um, we're making, we're taking steps in this direction. I should say mostly Neil Smith, not me, is taking steps in this direction to try to make this, these kinds of searching and this kind of scholarship possible. But um, there, there's still some and just, to clarify, just to clarify, Neil Smith, <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Neil Smith is one of your collaborators on the Homer Multitext Project, for people who don't know. Uh, also, right. Chris Blackwell is another key person on the project, and they're all working on this. And, you know, you're really talking about this idea, I think, of collaborative research also being very important, right? Yes. In, in this kind of approach. Um, you know, we're getting close to 310, so I just want to mention a few things yeah. that people might be interested in. Uh, so, you know, earlier during our talk, talk, Casey, you mentioned the catalog of ships. I want to let um, other people know that you and Mary Ebbett are actually working on a, a live blogging project related to that, right? Uh, the yes. catalog shift where you're live blogging that. People can look for that. Um, you yeah, some of the ideas that I was talking about today, uh, where I was trying to express today, are expressed much better in that blog. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. No, it's, it, it's absolutely beautiful. And it's a really amazing thing to see people collaborating together, right, in an open way, sharing their data, sharing their research as it's going. That's very, I think, technical of the kind of research that the center is trying to promote and encourage. Um, 
I just want to mention again, you mentioned your beautiful book on the poetics of ambush. So that's Casey Dewey and Mary Ebbett, Iliad 10 and the Poetics of Ambush. That's completely available on the CHS website. You can read the, the entire thing. Um, you're recapturing a Homeric legacy, images and insights from the Venetus A. Uh, from the Venetus A manuscript of the Iliad. This is a 3.5 megabyte beautiful book with full color illustrations. People can download this. Uh, you're the editor for that and there are many very talented scholars who have contributed to that volume. And then in addition, your two monographs, The Captive Woman's Lament in Greek Tragedy and Homeric Variations on Lament by Briseis. We could have spent probably five hours easily talking with you just about those themes. We didn't even, we, you know, we'll, we'll have to have you back to talk about that another day. Just so you know, uh, right now our Heroes X project, everyone is actually thinking about laments. So oh, it's, great. it's such a wonderful time to talk to you. Uh, we're talking about totally different things, uh, but oh so beautiful. Um, and it's always just a pleasure, Casey. You make me want to read it, read the Iliad and the Odyssey, <laughs> always. <laughs> Thanks so much, Claudia. Okay, and I want to thank everyone for joining us, especially yes, Marie Zanthu who will actually be our feature guest for an upcoming open house discussion. I believe, is it October 1st, Maria? Yes, she's nodding. Okay. So we're over time, but uh, I really appreciate everyone's flexibility. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget, in two weeks, we're going to be joined by actor, director, and writer Paul O'Mahony. Um, he has experience in creating and performing in productions of Greek tragedy. Uh, he's also created a performance called Unmythable, in which him and his colleagues have tried to compress in about 60 myths that they touch upon, Greek myths, within an hour. It's very wow. fun, high energy. So we're going to have a lot of fun talking to him. Totally different kind of discussion. Um, uh, inter uh, but I think it'll be equally as engaging, and we're so excited and glad that you joined us, Casey. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.